racing their boats through the open ocean, flying their jets, and patrolling in helicopters overhead along southern Florida, the people of the United States Coast Guard are always ready to put their lives on the line to serve, rescue, and protect. You're thinking about the people that you're there to help. You're thinking about the job that you're there to do. The Coast Guardsmen stationed in Miami and Key West battle dangerous conditions every day to enforce the law and save lives. Knowing that in the end, we're coming on top and we're going to win. It's the ex excitement of it. Sit down right there. The Coast Guard constantly faces unpredictable conditions. With danger as an understood and respected part of their job, the members of the Coast Guard bravely put their lives on the line every day. The United States has numerous water borders to protect, and Air Station Miami is the busiest air and rescue unit in the world. They cover over 55,000 square miles of ocean. Air Station Miami has eight HH-65 Dolphin helicopters and six HU-25 Falcon Guardian jets, with flight crews continuously on standby for law enforcement or search and rescue missions. While on duty, Petty Officer Eric Pointer works in the swim shop. On his 24-hour shifts, this award-winning rescue swimmer is always ready for emergencies, day or night. Now, launch ready 65 for SAR, launch ready 65 for SAR. 50 jets here, southeast from Key Biscayne. As soon as he gets the call, Eric heads for the locker room to get ready. The first step is to put on his wetsuit and survival gear. Meanwhile, helicopter pilots Lieutenant Marcus Kennedy and Lieutenant Lance Kerr come into the operations center. They get briefed on the mission. ...for a missing jet skier, 10 nautical okay. miles to the southeast of Key Biscayne. He was last seen around 1600. Uh, okay. And I'll pass more details as they, as they come to me. All right, Roger that. All right. I'll do what ORM. ORM is the Operational Risk Management Log. In it, Marcus fills in the flight details, writing in any potential risks associated with the mission. Lance surveys the latest weather reports, making certain it's safe for his team to go out. Weather's well, looking pretty good. We got some storms coming from the south, but it looks like they're dissipating into that building. A good Coast Guardsman, probably with somebody that's got stamina and determination. You know, you gotta have the stamina for the long hours and uh, to be able to be on the ready, like you gotta be in the Coast Guard. And determination to go through the training and to really have a need to complete the job. Got the search plan. Got the goggles. Ready to go. The helicopter crew is less than 30 minutes from launch and still has a lot to do. It's not a normal nine to five job. At any point in time, I could be shifting gears and doing something completely different. I couldn't imagine coming and sitting at a desk from nine to five. Can I imagine myself being in the ocean and getting paid to be in the ocean all day? Of course. The maintenance and helicopter crews are hard at work preparing the chopper for the mission. They have less than 30 minutes to get their chopper ready for takeoff. And a lot of times when people hurry, they end up making mistakes. They forget a couple of things here or there. And I've noticed that whether you run or you walk, uh, but if you do things quickly, you are still able to meet a launch window. And, and I can make sure that I've done everything correctly. As Marcus enters maintenance control, he meets up with Justin Swearingen, the flight mechanic. Justin has already been verifying the maintenance logs for the helicopter they will be flying today. We all basically just work as a team. Everybody knows, you know, their duties and their jobs through hours and hours of training, and everybody respects one another and each other's job. The vests the pilots wear are called SAR Warrior vests. They are actually inflatable life vests filled with essential survival gear. Should a major problem arise, these vests will be their best chance for survival. Marcus signs the aircraft out. With fuel calculations complete, they're off to the runway. By now, the helicopter is inspected and fully fueled. They finish up packing the last of their gear. Time is crucial. It will be dark soon, which will make finding the jet skier difficult.
Eric accounts for all of his survival gear. He's ready to go. Justin double checks the night vision components. With nightfall coming soon, this equipment will be essential. The pilots quickly reinspect the helicopter. One error and the mission could quickly turn into a disaster. You're under a lot of pressure when you are conducting these search and rescue missions. It's more so pressure that I think than stress, but you know, we're trained to handle those pressures and perform well under them. Less than 30 minutes after the initial call, the Coast Guard flies to the rescue. Getting a rescue helicopter so quickly in the air is a result of tight teamwork. The pilot makes sure his entire crew is on the same page. We have a missing jet ski, possible disoriented in a deep escape. We're going to go and do a predetermined search plan, and gain is going to be high, possibly saving a life. At night, finding a person that's in the water, it's like finding a needle in a haystack. And that's why the Coast Guard, we want people so much to wear strobe lights or some kind, have some kind of light source on them. As day turns to night, the pilots must now use their night vision equipment. We use night vision goggles, and the helicopter is really technologically advanced and helps us out tremendously with giving us the information to help fly through those kind of conditions. Flying over an ocean that has turned black as the night around them, the pilots are having trouble spotting the missing jet skier. I believe I do. Uh... They cannot find the jet ski, which may have sunk, so they concentrate on trying to find the survivor. Yeah, we got a little bit of a right for us right now. It's going to be a factor right now. Roger that. There's 50 feet for you. Roger that. All right, fellas, as we're coming up here, it looks like I, uh, I believe I see a person in the water. Marcus was mistaken. how difficult it is to see a person in the water with goggles. Yeah, I know. He may already be fighting hypothermia and drowning as a result. I see him. I see him. Lance thinks he may have spotted the victim. They turn around to take a second look. He's coming into the wind. Roger. Yeah, he should be out here to the right. I'm going to back it up a little. To the right or to the left? He should be to the right. Right, he's ahead of us. I think I see him. Justin, the flight mechanic, thinks he spotted the swimmer just off of the helicopter's nose. The survivor is still afloat and conscious. The pilots prepare the helicopter for a hover 25 feet above the survivor. Eric suits up, preparing himself for the rescue swim ahead, while Justin prepares the hoist that will lower Eric into the dark ocean below. With one final check, the cable is safely secured to his harness. Your adrenaline is pumping, and your adrenaline's going, and you're not thinking about yourself. At that, at that moment in time, you're very, you're selfless. So you're thinking about the people that you're there to help. You're thinking about the job that you're there to do. Justin coordinates his hoisting efforts with the pilots. Eric must be lowered into the water because at night it is too dangerous for him to do a free fall. Justin always keeps his eyes on the rescue swimmer in case something was to go wrong. Oh. 
Now that the jet skier is inside and safe, they switch off their night vision. Survivor, in the cabin? The pilots must hold the chopper in a steady hover until Eric has fully administered the necessary medical attention and secured the survivor. Eric first checks the survivor's blood pressure and respiration rate. Hypothermia is a severe condition that demands immediate medical attention. They need to take this man to the hospital as quickly as possible. Now we are in transit in route to Jacksonville Hospital. Eric now turns his attention to the flight team and begins briefing them on the situation at hand. Survivor is a bit uh, mild hypothermic, but we're warming him up back here and putting some blankets on him. Vitals well, seem pretty stable at this point. I got an IV going into him, giving him some fluids back. He seems a little bit dehydrated. And that could, uh, might be causing his ultramental status. He said he might have hit his head, so he has a possible head injury. Right now, he's uh, in and out of it. I'm just keeping him uh, awake, and uh, hopefully we'll get there pretty quick. Roger that. You continue doing that right now. We're about 10 miles uh, to the south of Jackson Bar Hospital. We'll be on deck there in approximately five minutes. We'll have medical personnel standing by to assist you with the patient. Hey, it looks like I'm clear to the south. I have nothing on TKS coming down or to the right. Roger. The hospital is equipped with a helipad, but performing a landing on a rooftop in the middle of the city also has its challenges. safely grounded, Eric accompanies the survivor into the hospital, where a team of doctors and nurses are standing by. Mission accomplished. Eric and his team can now return to the base knowing that they have saved another life. This is just one of 4,000 cases the Coast Guard will face this year. Being dispatched on a daily basis to save lives is a part of their job. With a flyby of beautiful downtown Miami, the rescue team now heads back to their base at Opa Loca Airport near Miami Lakes. Miami Air, Miami Air, Miami Air. 562 is back on deck. All right, welcome back. Air Station Miami has an army of mechanics continuously maintaining their fleet of Falcon jets and Dolphin helicopters. They must always be kept in top condition and be ready to go in seconds. Pilots Marcus Kennedy and Lance Kerr have to constantly train and fine tune their abilities to accomplish difficult maneuvers with the Dolphin helicopter. This is a simulated tail rotor failure in which the pilots have to practice a technique that allows them to land an aircraft with a failed tail rotor. This procedure requires the pilot to approach the runway with the nose of the aircraft skewed to the right. Then through careful coordination of the controls, he executes a running landing straightening the nose just prior to touching down. The Coast Guard swimmers must also stay in excellent shape, and motivating young recruits is part of their job. Hey, guys, Miller says he loves push-ups. Lean your rest. And up. And up. And up. You know, there's not many, too many jobs out there where you can say you get paid to work out. Let's go. Let's go. Come on. Low. 
They now execute pedal turns in both clockwise and counterclockwise directions to allow them to have 360 degree views of their search areas. A helicopter's strength is its ability to hover. Every pilot must master the various skills associated with hovering. The next challenge is flying backwards, which is a lot more complex and dangerous than putting your car in reverse. What, Miller? It's such a beautiful day here in Miami. You want to do flutter kicks? Let's go, flutter kicks, get there. The swimmers train the same way that military personnel do, the hard way. They must be able to carry twice their body weight, often in harsh conditions. When you train, and you train as much as we do, and finally you get to go in and you get to do your job, I think it's rewarding. Point your toes. Let's go, let's go, come on. Let's go. Rescue swimming is a life for me. Hoorah, hoorah, rescue, rescue. There's no quitting in our job. And that's pounded into us from the very first day. Nobody in our job is a quitter. is a life for me. Now Marcus and Lance are flying 50 miles out into the ocean for their final and most challenging training today. Landing on a moving ship at night. This is the Mohawk, a 270-foot Coast Guard cutter with a helicopter pad. Lance and Marcus must wait till darkness before they land on the moving ship. It's definitely the most riskiest maneuver we do is flying out over the water at night. Before you come in for a landing, they tell you what their speed is so you have an idea of it. But they're trying to get as fast as they can to give you more wind through the rotor head so it makes the helicopter makes it easier to actually come in and land. But it's all visual. It's all me just depth perception of seeing how fast they're moving and how fast I need to catch up to them. At night over the water when you're going to the cutter, um, it seems like a black hole. It's almost like you're in outer space and you're trying to dock with a space shuttle or something like that. The cutters, Coast Guard cutters are fairly small compared to most military style ships. One pilot is definitely always on the instruments and the other pilot's always looking out. It's always been the most strangest thing to come and land and have somebody standing that close right in front of you when you're coming and landing. It's definitely by far the most unique thing that we do. This is one of the most difficult maneuvers a helicopter pilot needs to do. A circle, easy forward, easy forward down. Any mistake could be disastrous. Now we got a lock. And we are locked. All right, we got two red on this side. Two on my side. Roger that. Right When the Falcon jet crews are not doing patrols for law enforcement, they work at the base doing collateral duties. The two jet pilots are Lieutenant Jason Barrett and co-pilot Lieutenant Stasha Kwiklinski. I feel privileged not because I'm a woman, but because I get to do this as a job every day. So it's a really fun job and I enjoy it and the people I work with are really great. And um, I really, I believe in what we do as a service. This is a search and rescue call. This is the moment they've trained so hard now, for. Launcher ready, Falcon for Star. Launcher ready, Falcon for Star. Recreational vessel taking on water, 10 nautical miles east of Fort Lauderdale. Now, launcher ready, 65 for Star. Launcher ready, 65 for Star. The helicopter crew is also needed on this mission as the dispatchers are uncertain about the state of the vessel and survivors. Grady White, uh, taken on water about 20 miles off of Baker's Hollow. Um, there was five POV, and they gave me this approximate location. They just faxed over the search area, and uh, if you guys have any questions, just give them a call. Okay, great. Okay. Can we get the stuff together, Sasha? Yeah. 
in the search plan. While Jason studies the mission, Stasha checks on the local weather forecast. Uh, I just want to let you know the... Uh, Jason calls the air traffic control tower. We're going to be heading offshore today, east of uh, Fort Lauderdale. Three hours, we should be launching in 30 minutes. Okay, thank you. If you guys need anything, just give me a call back on uniform. Great, thanks much. We'll, we'll see you, uh, we'll give you a call on the radio when we get out there. All right, have a safe flight, guys. Thanks, thank you. Jason and Stasha head to the maintenance control room to get information on the aircraft they will use. Jamar Jones, an aviation electrical technician, will accompany the crew. All right, let me try the plane. Okay. The jet and helicopter are now ready for their cruise. The Falcon jet weighs over 12 tons and has a fuel capacity of 10,430 pounds, making it possible to stay in the air for more than five hours. Jason must inspect the jet before taking off. The helicopter crew is also getting ready. Pilot Lance Kerr performs a pre-flight check on the Dolphin helicopter. The Dropmaster supervises the spin-up of the powerful engines to make sure they are both functioning properly. The jet taxis out to the runway. They've been cleared for takeoff. In 25 seconds, the Falcon jet accelerates down the runway, hitting 150 miles an hour before takeoff. Maximum speed is 470 miles an hour. I put in the coordinates for the boat, and our search area is in there. A few seconds later, the helicopter lifts off. After a little prior, so it's in parallel. I like to depart to the west. Do you have a rescue from on board? Over. All right, guys, offshore here, uh, going in search of uh, this vessel that's taken on water. And they're approximately uh, 20 miles out now. While Marcus is piloting out for rendezvous with the jet, Lance briefs the crew on the final details of the mission. Uh, if you see me coming, they're decelerating out to you. That means we're not going to make it and go ahead and blow the floats. If the pump doesn't work and the vessel is taking out more water than we can handle, we're going to go ahead and get them off the boat and hoist them up via the basket or if they're injured in any way, we'll adjust as necessary. The faster moving jet crew arrives on site first and locates the ship in distress. They relay the coordinates to the helicopter crew closing in. Yeah, we got position uh, 2553. The jet crew will try to drop a pump to the sinking boat. A jet flying low over the ocean with an open hatch is very dangerous. If you're down low and for some reason you lose an engine, it could be mere seconds before you have to impact the water. His first response should be to get the drop hatch closed immediately. The drop master unlatches the safety pin and waits for the command. 
Drop. 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 The pump is attached to a parachute that immediately opens and allows for the rescue equipment to be gently lowered to the boat taking on water. At a speed of 155 miles an hour, at 200 feet in altitude, the pilots have been able to drop the pump a mere 15 feet from their target. Nice job, look at that. The drop master must immediately close the hatch. Roger, sir. We're setting up a pump right now. Ten minutes after the jet made visual contact with the damaged boat, the helicopter crew arrives on the scene. Still outboard with the uh, blue top. That's affirmative. The boat crew must operate the pump and work quickly as their vessel continues to take on water. If the pump can get the water out faster than it gets in, the boat will be saved. The jet crew is still flying nearby. They have a spare life raft if needed. Uh, Julie Marie, Julie Marie, this is Rescue Coast Guard Helicopter 6562. Uh, it's pumping, but we're still taking on water faster than the pump can pump it out. Over. We're going to uh, place the helicopter in position to drop our rescue swimmer to swim on board. Uh, yes, sir, we copy that just fine. Speed's good for the door. Roger. Right. Uh, everybody review your egress procedures. Any lost comms in the back, just tap me on the shore and let me know what's going on. Eric radios the crew to give them an update of the situation. survivor jumps in the water to be towed toward the helicopter. Okay, got ready for pickup signals. Okay, 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 ready for pickup survivor. Roger, target is at my 132 o'clock. This is my hoisting altitude, around 30 feet. I have a little bit of a weird lead into the aircraft that's right outside the wind here. Max is going down. Justin pulls in the first survivor, all he can think about is the four other survivors still trapped on the boat below. Miami Air Station calls to check on the fuel situation. Hey, how much fuel do you guys have on board right now? Now we got uh, 600 pounds, you probably got about another 15 minutes on scene. 15 to 20 minutes. 
With strong winds pushing the helicopter, the pilots must work very hard to keep a steady hover. With the mission nearing a successful end, the Falcon jet crew can return to Miami Air Station. Kilo's on scene, hoisting the last survivor right now. And, all right, good gear flaps, hydraulics, we are clear to land. Good gear flaps, hydraulics, clear to land. My parents are concerned about the risks that we take on a daily basis. They always tell me that there are bold pilots and old pilots, but there are no old, bold pilots. So that's kind of their, their constant reminder to me to be careful and not to accept unnecessary risk. Back at the base, Eric gets a visit from his daughter and pregnant wife. The whole family will soon relocate to the Coast Guard station in Kodiak, Alaska. My immediate plans are to go to a Kodiak, Alaska. I'm actually being transferred there with my wife and my daughter and my soon-to-be-born son. A good friend of mine said, Eric, you haven't done the rescue swimming job unless you come to Kodiak. In Kodiak, the elements, the weather, they're that much more extreme. You don't necessarily want bad things to happen, but you want to be the guy on duty when those bad things happen. I'm excited about the harsh conditions in Alaska. The training that the Coast Guard has put me through is going to finally come into one, and I'm going to be able to do the job to the best of my ability. I'll leave the worrying part to my wife. Located 90 miles from Cuba and south of Miami are three Coast Guard stations. At the end of the Florida Keys is Sector Key West. Here, the Coast Guard crews mainly patrol with boats. The Coast Guard base has five vessels, two 270-foot patrol cutters, and three small patrol boats ranging from 25 to 47 feet in length. This 33-foot long boat carrying a crew of four men is a rapid and stable machine. Capable of withstanding 35 mile an hour winds, it has a maximum speed of 60 miles an hour. Almost all four crew members are classified boat drivers or coxswains, boarding officers, boat engineers, and gunners. We got people from all over the country that are work with us doing this, and the, the key for us is train, train, train. Um, we need to train, team coordination, get everybody on the same page. The crew must continually train in dangerous pursuit tactics. Everybody knows their roles before arriving on scene. Uh, it lowers the risk. They must also train firing their weapons at moving targets. Check fire! Check fire! Open fire! I don't know personally if I need the risk. Um, it's, it's part of the job, and it's actually probably the part of the job that keeps me coming to work. Open fire! Open fire! Open fire! Some things you, you learn not to tell your wife or your mother. They get a little nervous. The training exercise is finished. The crew goes on patrol. They receive a call about a stranded boater and respond immediately. In case it gets ripped, have... Roger. Case... This boat has run out of gas. Fox Trot Tango. You got a life jacket on? Or on, on board your boat somewhere? Let's grab that line. <laughs> Just need to see one. Again, I didn't ask all that. I just asked if you had a life jacket on. You're doing a safety check, aren't you, sir? After you put on a life jacket. So you basically wasted my time checking my shit. That's fine. It's your job. I'm not Upon arrival, the Coast Guardsmen immediately suspect I'm something. I'm trying to go to our damn birthday party in Spanish Beach. I ran out of gas. My bad. I got you. I like that. Now, what you need to do is come back here and sit down. Well, I just get on your boat and you guys uh, check my boat out first. That's not, actually, easy. that's not a bad idea. No, that's not a good, a better idea for you. All right, so gentlemen, I'm all about America, right? Yeah, the man is intoxicated. This is unsafe on the ocean. Uh, no I'm pissed off. I, oh, I ran out of gas. I couldn't get help. When I got help, y'all didn't care. You see how to drink today? I had a drink today? Yeah. Simple question. Simple question. How much do we have drink today? I had none. Uh, yourself? I had two. Two? Yeah. Beers? What kind of beverage? Two beverages. What type? 
Uh, they were alcoholic beer. So okay. Beer. Okay. You're in the cooler. Okay. Did you feel his eyes bright there too? He's crying. We're not gas, guys. Come on, jump on board. Notify station, we got one person on board. Uh, subject is very disgruntled, um, possibly intoxicated. Uh, stand by for further information. This aggressive man has the potential of becoming violent. He must be restrained for his own protection. Damn, you stay right there. Huh? You piss me off now. Man, I am fing legal 100%. Oh my God, you guys are kidding me. You guys are kidding me. Another Coast Guard vessel will tow his boat to shore. Uh, sir, am I under arrest? No, you're being detained right now. Uh, Sit am down. I under arrest? You're being detained. Am I under arrest? No, you're not. Let me the go. Just relax. Right. Right. Let me, am I under right arrest? Where you're at. Am I under arrest? You're about I'm to the fucking military. Seconds. Am I under arrest? Am I under arrest? No, you're not. You're let being detained for yourself. No, let me well, go. Am I under arrest? Right here. Am I under arrest? We're going back to the station. Do some field sobriety tests. Where's my boat going? It's going back to the station with, with us? us? Yes. Oh, screw it. All right. All right. All right. Then. You're going to relax? Right. Now now you said something, that's fine. OK, just relax. All right? No, no clue in my thing was going on. Right. Right. You got my glasses on. And then we tow the vessel, or the 5-5 five five tows the vessel. Oh, no, 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 no. Trust me, another Coast Guard boat. It's in our hands, right? Same place. It's in our custody right now. No, we'll no, take no, care no, of it. No, 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 no,
Find your subject. Get back. Get the. Get back. Get back. Guard your weapon. I've been sprayed. Partner, help. I've been sprayed. Get back. Guard your weapon. Get, get back. Get them eyes open. Get back. Get them back. back. Get back. Get back. Loud command. Get back. That's it. Stay back. There you go. Get back. Stay back. Remember, you're not the aggressor. Get back. Find your subject. Get back. Stay back. Stay back. Help. Good. Stay back. All right, Jessica, don't draw down. Get out on the ground. Get out on the ground. Cross your feet. Get out on the ground. Break. Get your head. Beat. <sighs> open your eyes on the water. Make sure you open your eyes. No. I know it's hard, but you got to open your eyes. No. Too. You got to get it out of your eyes. Okay. Better? Yep. You have people who don't even, doesn't even bother them. Like, just, they just wipe it off their face, and then they go about like it's normal. And then we've had people not able to handle it at all. They got to stop drill completely. You did good. Come over here. Come over here. Come on. On this three-day shift, Kevin has not yet dealt with any illegal migrant smuggling cases, which is unusual for this time of year. And the weather seems appropriate for trafficking. He will check the computer for new intelligence. Cuba is only 90 miles south from here. Uh, looks like what I'm looking for on here, uh, if we have any intelligence on go fast vessels or chug chug rafts um, leaving Cuba en route US at this time. As of 10 o'clock this morning, we have a possibility of a chug chug Cuban raft with an unknown amount of people that left, um, looks like Havana, Cuba at this time. Um, usually chugs or rafts like that um, only travel anywhere from three to five knots. So being 90 miles away, 15 to 20 hours before they get here. At this point right now, we have intelligence on uh, black go fast with white stripes, uh, two outboard engines, which is common for the smuggling vessels. So it looks like as of today, the migrant activity is gonna be picking up. Uh, once the weather lays down, like it looks like it is outside today, our activity with the migrant smuggling tends to increase. It has been kind of slow with the weather, and that's that's our job, that's what we wait for, so I'm hoping with the weather laying down that uh, we'll get an interdiction. While waiting for a new case, the crew plays against other fellow Coast Guardsmen to keep in shape. Out of all the units in Sector Key West, station's probably the most competitive. Nope. We hate losing. Come on, man. Base. It is late afternoon, and the men have not yet been called out. Suddenly, the alarm sounds, and they're off. Now, northbound TOI, 30 nautical miles south of Key West, Full Crew 1. Later Recent 30. intelligence has spotted possible go-fast smugglers nearing shore. The men load up their 40 caliber pistols in the clearing station. These pistols are crucial for personal defense. and just knowing that we have the, the vessels and the equipment to stop, stop these vessels, knowing that in the end, we're coming on top and we're gonna win. It's an ex excitement of it. We'll get in very close, just a few feet from another boat, and it, it can get pretty scary. Station Key West, Talon Sioux 6, go ahead. Sioux 6, Station Key West, Roger. They spot the suspect boat, which speeds off the minute they see the Coast Guard. Station QS, Talon 26, Talon 26. We're on scene in position 24, 32, 0849, with a northbound white hull, two persons visual. As soon as you put your lights and sirens on, they, they speed up. That's your max adrenaline right there. Stop your vessel, stop your vessel. This is the United States Coast Guard. United States Coast Guard. Para Subarco, Para Subarco. 
Vessel still refuses to stop. Step one and step two is ineffective. Vessels continue in northbound course. The chance a smuggler has a weapon is very high. And the way we prepare for it is we walk into the unknown. These men are obviously involved in some illegal activity. Station Key West, Talon 2-6. We have a clear, unobstructed view of the outboard. This calls for warning shots to try to convince the driver to stop. The Coast Guard must do whatever it takes to stop this boat without harming the occupants. Four went on targeted track. On targeted track. I'm target tracking! Open fire! Open fire! Bo aims his M16 and fires warning shots ahead of the boat. The go fast still refuses to stop. Report one ready. Now Damien takes position to shoot out the boat engines with his shotgun. I'm target and tracking! Target is the outboard engine. Center power. Open fire! Open fire! The traffickers quickly realize that they have no chance in outrunning the faster boat, but that doesn't mean the fight is over. Our crew must be on their guards as these men could be armed. Put your hands up! U.S. Guard, show me your hands! I got more people up forward. Keep an eye on that one. A Cuban family is found under the tarp. Just a family. Just a family. Any weapons? You got any weapons? These traffickers have no safety equipment. This angers our crew, who has witnessed too many unnecessary drownings in the past. You speak English? The migrant smugglers, in my opinion, are the lowest of the low. The most of them are parolees, just looking to make a quick buck. Um, they are not prudent mariners. They are some of the worst boat drivers I've seen in my life. Um, I, I have no sympathy for them. They're, they, they have no care for human life. Adult, two children. Got a knife. They have no regard for their own lives, the lives of uh, the Cubans that they're picking up or the regards for the law enforcement units that are chasing them. Hey, nice Check in there. there. Once you get the restraints on them, it, it's a relief. The mission, you accomplish it safely, your crew's safe, the smugglers themselves are safe, and the migrants on board are safe. I'm going to put the two smugglers on the bow. The migrants will be returned to their country, and the traffickers will be taken into custody. Step. This way. Oh, the boat over here. Sit down right there. We take risks. There are some times where we, you know, you think back and you say, oh my god, how did I live through that? And, and that happens sometimes, you know, after a high-speed chase, when we'll all be sitting inside the cabin and go, did you see how close we got to that guy? And, you know, there's a little laugh about it, but you can tell sometimes it's a nervous laugh. But we're all here. <laughs> the United States Coast Guardsmen are a courageous group of men and women, whether they work day or night, from boats, jets, or helicopters. They all work hard in protecting the public, the marine environment, and the security of their country.